Brother Taylor to read this passage from 1 Peter chapter 2. Because this passage is really integral to the message of the entire letter that is recorded for us and that we call 1 Peter, the first epistle of Peter, the first letter of Peter. If you look back at chapter 1, verse 1, Peter says that his letter is addressed to people who are scattered as aliens throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. This is part of the Roman Empire, the westernmost part of Asia, right across the Aegean Sea from Europe is where most of these places are, where Peter is writing to Christians. And this is part of the stronghold of the Romans. If you know anything about the Roman Empire, if you know anything about the culture of that day, then you will know that it was very religious. But its religion was very immoral. A couple, several, some time ago, Michelle and I had the privilege of visiting Pompeii in Italy. Pompeii was a Roman city that was destroyed in a, somewhere around AD 70 to AD 90, uh, right in the heart of the time of the church and the travels of the Apostle Paul, maybe a little bit after the time of the Apostle Paul. But it preserved in volcanic ash for almost 2,000 years the first century Roman city. And in this Roman city, spread throughout the streets, they had tiles put in the street, pavers, with directions. And those directions pointed to one place, a brothel. Throughout the city. So anytime you came to the city, all you had to do was look down at the street and find your way to a house of what we would call ill repute. And in that house of ill repute, even today, are mosaics, artworks, with little bitty tiles, less than an inch square, <coughs> making pornographic images. Preserved, even until today. That was Roman culture. That was what these people that Peter is writing to, people scattered throughout these Roman cities and Roman areas, are dealing with. And their deities, their gods, the Roman gods, far from the Greek gods, were filled with this type of immoral ideas and sexually explicit images. No other way to say it. And now we find our own culture going exactly the same way. I saw a news story just this weekend about the another one of the stories about the pervasive effect of pornography and about the overwhelming amount of pornography in our culture, and the way that it's attacking men and attacking men's minds and attacking men's brains and rewiring men's brains. It's a terrible problem. And yet, we have stories like what we heard about a week or two ago from Memphis. Memphis Public School, fifth grade, 10 year old girl, I have a 10-year-old fifth grade daughter here in Chattanooga, a few hundred miles west of Memphis in our own state. The teacher gives an assignment to write a story on your item. I can remember when I was in about second or third grade, I went to a, to a tiny elementary school, and our school only had about 20 or 25 students in each grade level. We were K through 8. And in kindergarten through the 8th grade, we only had about 250 students. And one day, to our tiny little town, Senator Al Gore Jr. came. He was campaigning. I don't remember if he was campaigning for re-election or for his first campaign as senator from Tennessee, but he won. But he came there on his campaign. He went to the bank. My mother worked at the bank. She was uh, a cashier at the bank. The class ahead of me 
got to go to the bank and meet Senator Gore. I didn't get to go. But one of the girls in the class ahead of me, a girl that I knew, asked Senator Gore, this is probably 1983, 1984, something like that, says to Senator Gore, who is your idol? And Senator Gore, as we now know, is not the most conservative man in the United States. Says, well, I wouldn't use the term idol. I don't like that word, but I do look up, then he starts naming all people that he looks up to. And that's exactly what my mother thought. My mother thought it was such a horrible thing for a eight or nine year old girl to think in terms of idols. Now we have magazine Teen Idol, we have a show, American Idol, and we have public school teachers teaching kids to idolize. So this 10-year-old girl that's been to school, when she's told to pick an idol, chooses God. And I saw a picture of her paper that she used to do the assignment. And she had put God in the middle and she had drawn things around it and then she put circles on the corners and wrote things that she admires about the God of heaven and earth. And the teacher saw the paper and gave it back to the student and said, you can't do that. You can't choose God as your idol. You have to do it again. And this paper can't even stay at school. You have to take it home. <coughs> so the little girl chose Michael Jackson. And that was acceptable. <coughs> That's our culture. That's our own state. That's our own government. That's where we live. First Peter 1, look at verse 15. Verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Brothers and sisters, here is our call. To live holy lives in this kind of culture. To live holy lives in a pagan, immoral world that strongly opposes all things God. And that's what the book of 1 Peter is about. That's what this letter is about. Be holy even while you're spread out in this pagan, immoral territory among all these people who didn't learn the Ten Commandments, they've never heard of the law of Moses, they don't know anything about the history of God's people through the ages, like it was when you were in Jerusalem, at least there, the people have been exposed to the moral teachings of God. Where these people are, that's not the case. And that is quickly becoming not the case where we are. So how do we do it? Well, that's why I asked Brother Taylor to read chapter 2, verses 4 through 12. First of all, you've got to look at yourself as special. When God says, be holy, he's telling you, you are holy, you be holy, you act holy. Holy means a lot of things. It means associated with God. It means set apart. It means special use. It's all of those things. But we don't use terms like holy very often. But we do use terms like special. Something that's set aside. Something that's reserved for private use. Look at what he says in verse 6. He says, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. That's Jesus. Jesus is the choice, the special, the set aside, the precious cornerstone from which everything else starts, from which everything else, or by which everything else is measured and judged. But then look at verse 7. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. This precious value that comes for Jesus is then given to us. And part of us, as we are built into the same household that begins with Christ, 
We become choice. We become precious. Look at verse 9. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That's us. We need to claim that title. And we need to start looking at ourselves as a, whole, as a royal, holy priesthood. Somebody that has been set aside for special use and special purpose. If you go to Ezekiel, and you can turn there, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to tell you what it says in Ezekiel 24. Ezekiel gives instructions for the priests and how the priests are supposed to keep themselves separate from impurity. How they're supposed to keep themselves and do things that prevent offending God. Ezekiel 24, verse 18, it says that they're to wear linen and not to wear any wool or any other type of garments that makes them sweat when they come into the temple to perform the acts of worship in the temple. They're not supposed to wear garments that make them sweat. They're supposed to be holy. They're supposed to be clean. God doesn't want them to be sweaty. Verse 20, he says, no long hair, no shaved heads. Trim your hair. You're supposed to look presentable when you come into the temple, God says. Verse 21, no wine when you come into court. You're to be sober. Verse 22, they were only supposed to marry virgins or widows of other priests. Verse 25, they were not allowed to touch a dead person unless it was a very close family member. Here's the message. They were special. They were set aside for a special purpose to carry out special tasks, and they were supposed to see themselves as special, as holy, as sanctified. And you come forward to 1 Peter, and he says, you are priests. You are a royal priesthood. You be holy too. So we're supposed to see ourselves that way. It breaks my heart when I see people treating themselves, treating their bodies as something unimportant. Think about your clothes. When I was a kid, when I would wear out a pair of shoes, it would become a pair of work shoes. And when it got too wore out to be a pair of work shoes, it would become a pair of creek shoes. And because when you go and swim in the creek, there's gravel and it cuts your feet or hurts your feet, so you wear shoes. But you want to wear shoes that you don't care if you have to throw them away if they wear completely out. But then I've got shoes on the day that I wouldn't wear in the creek. And even then I had Sunday shoes that my mother would have killed me if I had worn in the creek. One pair is set aside for something special. The other pair you can treat however you want to. Young women, let me tell you something. When you display your attractiveness in a sexually provocative way, you are lowering yourself to the value and saying to the world that my greatest value is what I can attract sexually. And you're wrong about that. You probably don't mean to say that. You probably don't intend to send that message. But that message shouts down every other message that you send when you leave with your sexuality. And it distracts almost every man you come into contact with. It makes it difficult for him to see your personality. It makes it difficult for him to see your spirit. It makes it difficult for him to see your kindness. He sees you as an object to satisfy a need. And you're treating yourself like an old pair of shoes that's good for nothing but wearing your free. People do the same thing with their time. They do the same thing with their minds and their entertainment. They do the same thing with their bodies, like an old pair of shoes. 
or an old dust rag. It used to be a nice hand towel that you kept in the good bathroom, maybe as a monogram, but then it gets worn out, so you start using it as a dust rag. Brothers and sisters, Christians are not dust rags. We are a royal priesthood set aside for God's own possession. And we don't belong in the creek. We don't belong in the dens of iniquity. We don't belong in the brothels. We don't belong in the drug dens. Because we're set aside for a special purpose. We don't have this importance in ourselves. We have it because God gives it to us. Matthew chapter 10 verse 29 Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your flock. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. God values you. God says you are important. God says you have an important function to fulfill. And it's time you start to see yourself that way and to treat yourself as set aside for a special use. Even in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Now look down at verse 11, 1 Peter chapter 2. Because you are special, because you're set aside, because you're a people for God's own possession. Verse 11, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Aliens and strangers. The older I get, the more I devote myself to trying to do things God's way, the more I devote myself to trying to remove my own will and replace it with God's will, the more I feel like a freak. The more I feel like I am just have nothing. I mean, where am I living? I'm nothing like these people. I used to be like them. But now I see them as crazy, and I know they see me as crazy. They're strange. And what they think is important, how they spend their time, where they get their pleasure, I see is dangerous and hurtful and evil. Abstain from fleshly lusts. Because you're supposed to be an alien and a stranger in this culture. In this culture where you people are living, where there is all of this ignorant paganism and idolatry and immorality, you're supposed to be different. Like an alien and a stranger, a person who doesn't speak the language, a person who doesn't know what's going on, who doesn't get it. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be freaks. We're supposed to stand out. We're supposed to not get in. That's what he's teaching. Romans 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of the Lord is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And the more I feel like a freak, the more I feel like I don't fit in, the more I feel like I don't belong where people who used to be my companions belong, the more I need the church. The more I need this congregation. The more I need the people here to support me and strengthen me and make me feel like I have a place. Look at what he says in verse 4. Coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, just like Jesus, Jesus is the living cornerstone, you also, as living stones, 
are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. We are being linked together. We are being cemented to one another for the purpose of carrying out God's will so that we can work together and accomplish a common purpose. We do have a place. We don't belong in the world and we are freaks in the world, but we belong here and we belong together. And we need everyone here to do their part. And I am less when you don't do your part and you are less when I don't do my part. Our common goal doesn't get accomplished effectively if we're not all working together doing our part. We're building a house. We are the house. We are the house. Ephesians 2.19 So that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Outcasts Freaks in the world, but fellow citizens together in the church. That's what God offers. To do that, to fulfill our roles, to be the living stones doing what God wants us to do, we've got to maintain that holiness. We've got to abstain from those fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul that he talks about in verse 11. Lust, fleshly lust, Cause division. Galatians 5, 17 says, For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. Notice this. So that you may not do the things that you please. So that you may not do the things that you please. That's not a very good sales pitch for Christianity. If you're going to be a spiritually minded person, then you can't do what you like to do. But if you're a fleshly person, and what you like to do caters to the flesh and satisfies fleshly desire, that's the truth. You can't do what you like to do. But as you become a spiritually minded person, and as you focus on the spirit and put the spirit in charge of the flesh, then you learn that the pleasure that comes from spiritual activity is far greater and longer lasting than the pleasure that comes from the fleshly activity. But if you're involved in the flesh and you want to be with God, you've got to not do what the flesh wants to do. Is that simple? James chapter 4 verse 1 says, What is the source of quarrels? And conflicts among you is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members. You give in to the fleshly desires which these pagan immoral cultures cater to and tempt you with over and over again. It prioritizes you, it deprioritizes God. It prioritizes what you want and deprioritizes what's good for other people. And you get further and further away from what God wants you to be, from doing what God has put you here to do, from being the living stone that God calls you to be. And sure enough, you start hurting other people, you start worrying about yourself, not worrying about others, and then quarrels and conflicts and disputes and divisions arise because of flesh. So verse 12, 1 Peter chapter 2, very simple. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. You are a Christian. You are a block in God's building. You are a priest. In God's kingdom. A good scientist keeps his lab clean, free from impurities all the time. A good athlete eats healthy food all the time. A good storekeeper 
keeps his shelves organized and well stocked all the time. A follower of Jesus keeps his behavior godly all the time. That's what he is. That's his nature. Romans chapter 6, verse 12. So do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Do not go presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Your hands are instruments of God's righteousness. Your mouth is an instrument of God's righteousness. Your feet are an instrument of God's righteousness. Hold a chosen people for God's own possession. That's what he calls us to be. And to see ourselves that way and to act in accordance with that. Keeping our behavior excellent even among a pagan, immoral, godless culture. We're not the first ones to see it. Ours is not yet as bad as theirs was when First Peter was written, most likely. Our persecution is certainly nowhere near as bad as theirs. And if they can do it, so can we with God's help. If you haven't been living the life that God calls you to live, if you haven't been doing things God's way, if you haven't been treating yourself as part of God's holy people, you need to change. If you've never been set apart for the first time, set apart for God and purified by the blood of Christ, God is willing to do that for you right now. To put you in contact with the blood of Christ, just like the instruments in the temple worship were sanctified with blood, Jesus will sanctify you with his own blood. But you have to come to him. If you need to come to Christ, come today. Put your faith in Jesus. Confess your faith. Repent of your sins. Be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sin. If you need to come to Christ, if you need to return to Christ, please come down front as we stand and sing.